Thanks. Um, Juan Benet, IPFS. Thank you. Um, is there like a mic? My name is Juan, and uh, I came up with a thing called IPFS a while back. And uh, there are several projects that we're doing now. IPFS is probably at the center of everything. Um, and there's a new model for the web. And of course, this is blockchain university, uh, but I will speak about this a little bit more generally than that, because this, this though IPFS relates to blockchains, it isn't just about blockchains, it's about the web itself. And uh, yeah, I, I'll uh, perhaps mention some of the other things that we're doing, but this, is, this whole thing is probably gonna be mostly about IPFS. Um, it might be useful for us to jump onto a Gitter channel together, so we can copy and paste hashes, but we can, we can probably do that right after this section. So what I'll do is I'll give you a quick presentation on what IPFS is, how it works, um, what is the model behind it, uh, what are the problems that it's trying to solve uh, in a very general sense, uh, how it relates to blockchains in general, um, how it relates to the web. Then I'll go through um, <coughs> how to use IPFS, so we'll actually go through and install the, the system, we'll play around with it a little bit together, uh, and then we'll discuss how to like build things on top of it. Uh, and then we, it'll be sort of like open to questions and open to, we can do whatever we want on top of it. Um, so it's called IPFS, uh, and it's, uh, that stands for the Interplanetary File System, and that's a throwback to Lake Leiter, who said that the, net, the, he had this vision for, uh, for computers, this was back in the 60s, uh, he said, uh, that he wanted to construct, uh, he wanted to wire up all the computers in this massive intergalactic network. And that, today, we call the internet. So the internet stands for the intergalactic network. So do think about that when you, when you think about the internet. Uh, and so IPFS is, is the file system to write on the intergalactic network, hence the interplanetary file system. Uh, it actually makes the web capable of working across really long range lengths that uh, are slow because you can ship entire applications in one go and then operate on them and move data very slowly. Meaning, if you think about the web today and you were browsing the web through Mars, you would have like an eight minute lag time to any website. <laughs> and like that's just unacceptable. Uh, but anyway, that's, that's the story of the name. Uh, so the internet is this, this intergalactic network is this uh, amazing nervous system that we're all creating, right? And uh, we're all part of all these applications that we run. I don't really need to describe this very much, but I want to set it in context because uh, our entire lives today are ruled by the applications we create. Uh, in a big, in a very real way, the software that we use and the software that we create as software engineers and designers and so on um, gives humanity amazing capabilities. And you when you craft software, you're creating tools and services that you put into the internet. And now other humans, millions of other humans, billions even, will then use these services and acquire abilities that weren't there before. Right? They will suddenly be able to message the other, their, their loved ones. They will be able to message other people that they're working with in, almost instantaneously. They'll be able to collaborate on things almost instantaneously. They'll be able to speak real time with people around the globe. They'll be able to manipulate, um, they'll be able to like, remote control into some robot and like move things around or like do surgery across long range lengths, right? It's absurd what we're now able to do thanks to this amazing um, thing that we call the internet. And the web and the web applications that we put onto this internet uh, pretty much define the capabilities that we have. So it's, it's a problem. So, so the web today has a few problems that we have become very concerned with and we are tackling head on. Um, and this sort of happened um, by accident. I, I, I didn't say, I'm gonna go and fix all these problems. Uh, I sort of created this thing called IPFS. Uh, wasn't even called that at the time. And it sort of ballooned into possibly solving a number of these problems. So, all right, the problems. Uh, back in the day, uh, Paul Baran, and I need to figure out whether it's Paul Baran or Baran, but I think it's Paul Baran, uh, came up with this, uh, notion of categorizing networks, and, and he, was a, he was one of the co-inventors of packet switching. Uh, so way before the internet, packet switching was a way of, of connecting different sets of computers together and moving around data instead of doing this like long range link where you have a dedicated line of segmenting data into small packages of, of, 
bytes that would like push. Uh, it's basically a way of multiplexing many streams into one. Um, it's like a very <laughs> simple definition of it. Uh, and he came up with this categorization of networks, and he said, okay, well, they're centralized, decentralized, or distributed. And pretty much categorizes how we think about networks today. Um, you know, a lot of people talk about uh, Bitcoin and the blockchain as being this amazing service because it really makes it distributed, right? And it both decentralizes the payment processing and it really makes it distributed. Anybody can run this node and communicate to anybody else uh, and have this, you know, you can have like half of the network disappear and the other half continue to, to operate normally, right? Maybe not half, like, I don't want to go into like the whole like half 51% stuff, but unrelated. Um, but the web, and, and so the web at the very beginning started like this, right? So Tim Berners Lee created HTTP to be a client server thing that everybody could run. And so in his model of the world, you would run a, an HTTP server locally <coughs> and an HTTP client locally, and you would re request for other people's stuff, and you would host some of your own stuff, and you could publish things, and you could give people links, uh, you could give, give people these references to, to data um, that they could post on their documents, and you would have this amazing distributed system emerging where anybody could publish any document, right? And it was an amazing vision um, that created a uh, tremendous amount of, of value for the world. Uh, it totally upset how the status quo worked, and we had this amazing explosion of the web. Uh, but over time, it's gotten centralized, right? So when you think about the web today, and you think about the systems and the applications that you use and run, uh, it doesn't really look like this anymore, right? Like, you don't think about publishing with your client locally, you're loading some piece of code from some remote server, manipulating it and sending that data to that remote server, and letting that server do whatever it wants to that data. Right? So think about uh, most social networks today, like the way that you communicate with everybody that you know, probably goes through one of maybe five like centralized services. Right, most people? Um, and, and that's kind of, uh, pretty bad for a number of reasons, uh, and mostly uh, technical ones. Uh, but I want to describe a little bit of how we got from this distributed world into, you know, through decentralization all the way to really being properly centralized. Where, and then in centralized view, you have a whole bunch of uh, web browsers that are all talking to some small set of HTTP servers, right? Nobody thinks about running an HTTP server in your local machine when you're browsing the web. And that's just, what? What does that even mean? Uh, and, and this actually all comes down to location addressing. Um, and so this is the idea that uh, when you look at a URL, which is a, an identifier uh, of a resource on the web, the domain, which is a, a nice readable name that maps from a nice readable thing that you can tell people to a bunch of numbers, uh, those numbers, the IP address, specifically points to a set of computers out in the network. Normally it's just one computer or one host, but today we, we have all these hacks to make it look like there's many computers at that address. So when you request the file foobarbass.png, you're telling the internet, hey, please go to 10.20.30.40. You're telling your browser, please go find this specific computer and request foobarbass.png from that computer. Uh, and what does that look like, right? So imagine that this is you in blue, and that all of these computers have a copy of that of that picture. But the only computer out there that is 10.20.30.40 is that one. And of course, you have to go and request the file from there. Uh, no matter whether another computer right next to you in the same room has that file and can be serving it to you, no matter if another process on the same machine has the file and could be serving it to you. Uh, now, of course, this has a lot of problems, right? Uh, this has a, a whole series of implications about how we use documents and data and applications on the web and on the internet uh, that all fall out of the fact that we have this model at the very bottom. And of course, the most obvious ones are bandwidth and latency. I'll discuss this in a bit. Uh, there's also this notion of being offline and online because you're talking to specific servers. If you're disconnected from that server, in relation, your browser in relation to that server is now offline, yet there's a link that's cut in between. Uh, 
which means that even if in this whole room we have a whole bunch of computers and a whole bunch of files and a whole bunch of applications that we could run together and work together with, if we lose connection to the backbone, we're now all offline, right? And very few applications are built to handle that. Uh, implications of security, permanence, uh, you know, multiple devices, what happens when we have our cell phones, laptops, watches, ankle bracelets, headbands with, they're all, you know, fridges in the house that are all connected to the internet. What happens when all of these devices have specific resources that they have to talk to, but they lose connectivity to the backbone? Uh, and of course, there's the notion of data sovereignty, and that is a whole massive talk, or even you can run a, many conferences about data sovereignty. You know, what happens with the data that you create? Who owns that data? Where does it go? Um, who has the right to publish it? Um, when you make a post in one of these social networks, uh, what if that social network decides that you know, their business model changed and they're no longer going to be serving this document or whatever it is that you posted, and now all of the links that you gave out to people will break because they're going to switch things or something. Or maybe they, they're going to put a paywall in front of it or whatever. You no longer have control over the information that you're publishing. Uh, so again, the, the web was meant to be this publishing medium. Right? This goes all the way back to Engelbart at the beginning of personal computing. And you know, if, you, if you haven't seen the Butler Wall demos, this is the beginning of personal computing in the 60s. Um, and it was all about collaboration, human collaboration and human publishing as a way of um, interfacing hundreds, thousands, millions of humans together um, into a network that was extremely efficient. And so, so, you know, it really matters uh, what, how we deal with who has sovereignty over this data and who gets to, to decide what happens to it, who gets to, to comply with, um, you know, policies and what sorts of policies are, are these and so on. All right, so to illustrate bandwidth and latency, you know, if we're in a room kind of like this uh, with a whole bunch of people and, uh, you know, I take a picture and I upload it to Facebook and I send you all a link, you now all have to re make requests to Facebook and pull it down. And so what that looks like in the back in the back one is sort of, sort of like this. So if the picture is a megabyte and I'm uploading it and then I send you the link through some out of that channel uh, and now 30 computers go and like request it and we're all on the same router. Uh, you're now pulling down 30 copies of the same picture, which you know is potentially like 240 megabytes, right? And that, that's pretty bad, not terrible, but pretty bad. We mostly can deal with this now, and it's, it's not a big hitch. But what happens when we deal with video, right? When we, uh, when instead of a small image, we're downloading like a 200 megabyte video, and so all people at the same time hammering the network, uh, we this could be like 48 gigabytes of bandwidth wasted. Um, you know, maybe not all 48 are wasted, 48 minus 200 would be, would be wasted. Uh, where at each one of those links, there's routers that have to ship these bytes, and they're all encrypted with different keys and so on. Um, and that's a really big point that, that I probably won't get into in this talk. Uh, cryptography and the way that we do security around content has to change uh, to accommodate a different model. But uh, this is a pretty bad picture, right? And we've actually known about this for a long time. Like, people have been People in the networking and, and the server systems community have been discussing this for decades, right? And it, it, the debate kind of silenced because nobody could figure out how to properly deploy these systems in the, in, in the large internet. And there were a lot of really good proposals, but they just never took flight for whatever reason. Um, and uh, all right, so that's kind of what the bandwidth and latency problems look like. Uh, you, you'll notice that like when we have to request all this stuff from the network, we're not only are we wasting bandwidth, but it's really slow, right? Like depending on where you are. So here in Silicon Valley, um, the, the birthplace of the internet, we, we don't have that fast internet as you know people in Estonia or South Korea do. Uh, so uh, it won't be as good. Uh, and you know you can imagine what it's like in some remote location of the earth, um, where you can imagine a classroom of people. Um, they're all trying to learn or trying to like watch some important video that is going to describe them some important fact about humanity and they can't see it because the bandwidth that they have is very limited or the latency is enormous and like the application is just like oh well sorry we don't we don't support your network because it's just too slow uh, and that's awful right like that's really awful for people out there that manage to get connected to the internet but don't have the capabilities that some of the more affluent places in the world do um, 
All right, so online versus offline. Uh, this picture, the picture of this room is so iconic. Like, it, it demonstrates so many of these problems. Uh, but imagine that, like, I created a Google Doc and sent it to you, and we're all now going to collaborate on this Google Doc. And we're now all working on it simultaneously, and we have to ship all our updates for this Google Doc to the backbone and back. Right? So that not only is that horribly inefficient, because every single keystroke that we do, because we want it to feel really real time and nice, uh, is now shipped all the way to some remote server and has to be pulled down all the way back. And you know, thankfully, the network is fast enough that we can actually do that. Uh, but you know, with 30 people, it gets trickier and trickier. And what happens when the network breaks? Right? So even if we're all connected into the same network and the same Wi-Fi router, if the connection to the backbone breaks, we're, we're stuck. We can't actually work together. I think that that might have been OK um, a few years ago. But today, I can kind of have gone to uh, deem this basically unacceptable. <laughs> like we, if we have a, um, a, a, you know, I'm not, I'm not picking on Google here. Like, like all these applications that I, I tried all of these, and they all broke down uh, in some way or another when you try to, uh, to work in this kind of like offline collaborative way, where like I am capable of, of taking, carrying out some actions with another person physically right next to me, and. If we are disconnected from the backbone, it halts, and you can't do anything. And you know, a while back we could hide behind the fact that well, distributed systems are really hard, and reasoning about uh, you know concurrent updates to data structures is really difficult. But in the last decade, we've come up with many ways solutions to these problems. In fact, um, Google Docs invented like the way that. This came actually from Google Wave way back. Um, so Google Wave invented this cool technology called operational transforms, uh, which allow people to create all these updates locally. In fact, you can even be working on your computer, sort of disconnected, and make some updates that will get um, eventually uh, propagated to the backbone and then apply to the whole document. Uh, so we have that technology now. We have the technology to deal with um, data structure updates in this large-scale distributed systems uh, we just haven't really sunk in those ideas down into, into the applications we use every day. Uh, it gets worse, right? Like, what if the applications you, you use are critical to communication with your, with your family or with uh, your coworkers or with the people that you care about, and suddenly, one morning, your government decides uh, to give you some surprise impression, right? And decides to shut off access to the internet because they're worried that you're going to overthrow them, which is a very real thing that we just, you know, not just, but we saw happen recently. Um, these applications were critical to those events. And luckily, there were a whole bunch of hackers over there who would set up ad hoc wireless mesh networks and connected everybody to like, these other pipes uh, that were you know, unregulated by, by, the, by the governments to be able to uh, communicate. And in many cases, this was a life or death situation. People were sending around information as to you know, troop movements and you know, anti-riot um, police and all this kind of stuff through these communication networks. In fact, uh, I don't know if you remember, but um, I believe I believe this was uh, Hillary Clinton when she was in, in the Secretary of State. Um, if I'm remembering my history correctly, uh, my ancient history correctly, uh, she went to Twitter and said, like, "Look, you have to keep the servers online. Like, there is a massive social upheaval moment." Going on in the in the in, in Egypt, like you have to. I think maybe Tunisia, but it was. Um, you have to keep all these servers online. What do you need? What do we do? Like just keep this thing running, right? And why is it going to Twitter servers? Like why is it going from like the local area network? If they want to send messages to each other, why does it have to go all the way to the backbone and then out? Like this is to me absurd. Like we we know how to make these eventually consistent systems in the large. Uh, those messages should have been propagating through that local area network. And working, and eventually being committed all the way to the rest of the to the rest of the network. All right, uh, permanence. Permanence is a huge deal to me um, because uh, our ability to describe to, to publish documents and, and describe documents uh, is critical to human evolution. You know, in a way. Like, so, so I'm not talking about biological evolution. I'm talking about mimetic evolution and social evolution. Um, the, the permanence of documents and the permanence of being able to describe knowledge and ideas and and you know not not just knowledge about um, politics and so on, but I mean knowledge about how to do things, like 
knowledge about how to make fire is like a really basic idea, but like knowledge about how to construct a water purifier, knowledge about how to construct uh, a computer, knowledge about how to construct the basic things that you need, um, is currently all being put into this web um, that happens to be writing on this digital medium that we're creating that in my view is very brittle uh, because it has all these points of failure potentially uh, simply because of how we've architected things. And so in the old days, uh, you know, we, we've, for, for a long time we, we've thought about book burning as this horrible, horrible thing and we've chastised every society that went through and book burned as this, um, you know, terrible, awful thing that uh, should never happen. Um, and we've, we've sort of seen them as like these pathological cases where societies clearly went terribly wrong and, and sick, um, and they went through the process of burning information. Uh, and so back in the old days, you had printing presses, and you would create copies of books, and you could make many of them, and so when the book printers came by and destroyed many copies, uh, you could just make more copies, right? And that's sort of true today, um, except that when we, when we browse the web, we encounter broken links. And while the file could still be there, and you can still search for it and access it, most applications don't do that. Most applications don't try to access a resource and say, oh, the resource is not there. Maybe we should run a search over it. Uh, oh, who else has this? That doesn't work that way, right? We, we create, we trust links to exist, and we trust links to remain there. Um, as a way to build these large-scale network applications where we expect data to be available and data to be um, able to be surfaced. Uh, so this goes from important documents about knowing how to do things to critical data that is relevant to potentially your life. Your medical records could suddenly 404 and like your doctor has like no idea what happened because like maybe some natural disaster took down the data center where they were stored. Like hopefully there was some redundancy but maybe not. Maybe that company went out of business. Like what? What if like a whole bunch of other computers have those medical records, but that link is broken? So how do they search it, or how do they access it? Maybe there's like a whole bunch of like sudden paywalls, or not even paywalls, but just flat out walls that don't allow them to access that that piece of those pieces of information. And uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of people that have been talking about this and trying to come up with solutions, including Tim Berners-Lee, Ben Cerf, uh, Brewster Kale from the Internet Archive. Like they're all very worried about these problems and trying to construct different additions to the web to make it um, just solve these issues. All right, so link, links are broken. And, and I would claim that, that the reason this is a huge problem is because we're using location addressing. Uh, that it's, it's uh, the fact that our links embed within them the notion of where to go is the key problem. And uh, actually, the W3C uh, knows this and for a long time has been trying to push people to move from URLs to URNs, which are universal resource names, um, uh, which are URLs and URNs, or both URIs, which are universal resource identifiers. Uh, and they know this is like a better model for permanence and all that kind of stuff. It's just that um, you know we, we haven't really seen that in a large. Uh, and why haven't we if we've known about a lot of these solutions of how to potentially build the web in a different way? I think it's it's a performance problem. I think most companies out there that get to make these decisions uh, don't see these other systems as being relevant enough because it's easy, it's really easy to just wire up an XTP server and run it. Right, that's it, done. And they just keep doing that for years and years and years and they're not gonna go back and change their entire architecture. So if we want any real change, we have to come in with a, a, a huge cost savings to business. We have to come in with a, a strong economic argument of why it makes sense to move from, from a position where links are structured based on location to a position where links are structured based on um, the actual content. Uh, and I'll describe that, how that works in a moment. But the picture of the web today is, you know, we, we can think of this idealized web of documents, and this was sort of like the, the sketch diagram that Tim described in his paper way, way, way back. Uh, but it's not really just a web of documents in the abstract, it's a web of documents on specific devices. That's how the web works today, uh, for the most part. And when you know anybody, for whatever reason, parts of those devices can break, and those links are, can no longer be followed, even if those exact same files are elsewhere. All right, hopefully I've impressed upon you the importance 
uh, of some of these issues. And the subtle way in which location addressing uh, bubbles up to have fundamental implications to how you operate as a human on a daily basis. So what do we do, right? Like, how do we fix this problem? Like, there, there's some good news here. And the good news is that the internet is an amazingly flexible place. Uh, the internet is run from like a best idea first type of environment. And all you have to do to make the internet better is come up with a different protocol that solves some of these problems. You have to understand how this protocol is going to relate to the rest of the world and the rest of the protocols that exist. And you have to propose a solution um, with code. You have to go and implement your protocol and see if it actually works, test it, make sure that, it, that it's better, and then push it as a, as a, as a change. Uh, and if people agree that this is a good idea, the internet will move forward. But again, we have to make that strong uh, economic case around it. So how do we get back from the web being centralized to distributed? Right? And so there, there's a lot of ideas around this, and many, many um, papers have discussed many different approaches. And we sort of take many of the great ideas and synthesize them in, into a, a sort of package that we're calling IPFS um, that is easy to plug into the existing network today and the existing ways that people are building applications and deploying them um, now. Uh, because if we don't do that, it's never going to happen. Uh, and, and at the core of how IPFS works is this idea of content addressing. I'm sure you're probably familiar with this. Uh, instead of this location idea, what if we address things by mapping the names to a hash of the content? So that anybody could be could provide and serve that file if it was around. So if they have it around. So visually, uh, if you know that computer so in the HTTP world we would have to go and ask that computer for it. In the IPFS world, which you know really goes back, uh, there's a whole bunch of other systems that work this way. Uh, what if any serve, any computer that has that file could provide it to serve it? That's what this is all about, making that possible. So in the video uh, example, instead of pulling it down 30 times, we would pull it down once, roughly, uh, perhaps a little bit more, and we would be able to, peer to distribute a peer-to-peer -peer around us, and if the network breaks, it doesn't matter. We can still view it because the links are the same. The links don't change. And that's the critical part. If the links are the same, uh, this is like a really subtle thing. Right? Like you, think, you would think that just a string of characters could change and it doesn't matter, but when you hard code or when you organize how strings of characters move around, um, that process is often what defines whether or not an application will break. Um, so if the link is the same, we could continue to view it. And we have that working today. Like we, with IPFS, we could all be browsing the web and disconnect the, the internet, and, and if the file is here in this room, it will continue playing. Uh, and uh, All right, so that's content addressing. IPFS is, we, we like to call it the permanent web because we're, we're creating permanent links for every thing, single thing that goes onto the web. Uh, and it's really, uh, we used to call it a peer-to-peer -peer file system, a peer-to-peer -peer version file system, and it is that, definitely that, and that's how it started. Uh, but it makes more sense today to describe it as a new hypermedia distribution protocol. So that means a new, so a protocol is just a way, a way that we agree we're going to do things. Uh, a way that we agree we're going to do things, we're going to move around documents, media, applications, and so on. So all IPFS is is a new way of moving around data that represents media, <coughs> uh, media that is linked. That's what hypermedia is. So let's take the web and patch it, right? Like let's let's take the web and figure out how we can improve the existing model. So without changing how the current applications are being developed, um, perhaps we, we might have to tweak a few things. Uh, but for the most part, we could have a transition that is very seamless um, and make it possible for people to start using it today, uh, where we. We take the whole notion of the web, which is to create this, this massively linked medium, uh, which allows people to write these publishing systems that happen to be um, hyperlinked and happen to be applications as well. So you can run code and, and do all sorts of, with that. The moment you can run code, you can do anything, right? Uh, if it's directly. 
Uh, and IPFS looks like this. It, it takes a whole bunch of ideas that have been around for a long time, um, but basically after the web, and says, if we were architecting the web today, how would we do this? And that looks like a set of solutions. And then from that set of solutions, let's extract out all of the things <coughs> that don't make sense, as in like that, that we wouldn't be able to move from the point where we are today to the point where we can get to. And so it's we've charted out a path of the web now moving towards towards this, this other world. Uh, and so this translates basically to a, to a stack. And so we have like this, this layered stack of protocols. So IPFS is not just one. So it's one protocol that's a meta protocol that, that wraps a whole bunch of other ones. And we have this layered system where at the very bottom is this network piece that allows us to convert point-to-point -point links to a large network where anybody can find anybody else in relay messages. Um, for the most part, there's some corner cases where you can't reach anybody for privacy and anonymity reasons, but mostly we won't talk about that uh, today. Uh, on top of the network, we have routing, which is what allows you to find each other. Uh, we engage in, in a routing system. Uh, we, for, the, for that, we've been using a DHT, but we re realize that it's important to not just only use a DHT, but make it general enough to swap out. Because DHTs change over time, we come up with better ways of doing them, or perhaps an entirely different system that is not a DHT but functions like one uh, could emerge. And we want to be able to just bring these new changes into the thing without having to lock ourselves into one, one way of doing it. On top of that, there's an exchange process, which is similar to how BitTorrent works. Uh, BitTorrent was an amazing, brilliant, amazingly brilliant uh, idea about how to get a whole bunch of computers to exchange data very efficiently um, and, and in a non-zero-sum kind of way where people are trading together to, to uh, distribute all these files. And so our, we have an exchange that is sort of a generalization of BitTorrent that opens it up not only for point-to-point -point exchange of data or exchange of data in a swarm, but rather exchange of data that may be exchanged at different ratios. Like for example, if I have a very coveted piece of data and the whole network wants it, I might be able to like increase the, the ratio of sharing where, where I'll give one block of this data for three that I want or something. Uh, this suggests clearly that perhaps you could think about currencies here. So in, in any system of barter, you could actually put in currency as a mechanism to allow people to abstract away the notion of sharing specific blocks of data and instead I share data to you, I earn some currency for doing this, uh, and then I can t turn that currency and exchange it for something else. So that is what, uh, what our exchange layer is about. Um, we, in, in the implementation, I'll, I'll discuss basically what's implemented at this point, but in the implementations we have today, the exchange is, is pretty basic and pretty dumb. It's just shipping around data because that works for us today. But it's important to have that layer in so that um, wh what we see with the exchange is this flexible protocol where our computers could, could talk and then negotiate what other protocols of exchange we, we run. For example, I could connect to somebody and request a file, and they say, great, like, I'll give it to you for uh, some other piece of data. Uh, great, so I send them other data they, they want, and I get the piece I want. Perhaps they're just altruistic, like in the HTTP world, and they'll just give me the data. Awesome. In another, in some subset might speak Bitcoin and say, oh, actually, I'll give you this data right now really quickly for some amount of Bitcoin, some small microtransaction. And they should be able to upgrade to running a transaction in that process, or maybe doing some like, fast micropayment channel ideas and so on. Or Ethereum, or a number of other protocols uh, that they might be running uh, to, in order to negotiate with that exchange. But the, the important piece here is to establish a common layer of barter from which that is extensible enough that in, in a very standard way, it's extensible to protocols saying, oh yeah, you speak Bitcoin, I speak Bitcoin, let's deal in that. Or, hey, like, I'll just give you data for free because I, I just want you to have this data. I'm a, I'm a service provider. We have some other out of band deal um, where you know I take your data or whatever, or I hold it for you, and I'll just give you the data for free. And so HTTP today is in the world of giving data for free. BitTorrent introduced the idea of let's take and it, like, let's move to an exchange of data that's mutually beneficial. And we're saying let's take that one step further and say let's generalize that to currencies. Um, and not just currencies, but any kind of mode of exchange that is upgraded through a standard process uh, of, of defining how we negotiate. Think of it kind of like a, like a TLS uh, or SSL cipher suite where you say, um, oh, well, I speak, um, I speak 
this set of ciphers and you speak that set of ciphers, which one do we choose? Great, like this makes a, this negotiation makes sense. Now we can speak in a secure channel. That trans carries over to, to our exchange idea, which is what kind of data exchange could we uh, undergo? Oh, great, like let's upgrade to that one. And in our model, not one person wouldn't have the data you want, many people would have the data you want, so you could be interacting with a whole bunch of other people and dealing with different modes of exchange. So this, this creates a very flexible platform for archival nodes that are altruistic to give data, uh, but then other nodes that are really fast caches to come in and really fast caches that are well located on the network to come in and perhaps earn um, some value for that service. Uh, on top of that is what we're calling the Merkle Act. And this is basically straight up from thinking carefully about Git uh, and a whole bunch of other protocols that are, that are Merkle tree-like, uh, and Bitcoin is one of them, for example. And that is just a, a model for how the data is structured on the web. I'll, I'll speak about it more in a bit. Uh, on top of that, we have naming, which is straight up from SFS. Um, what is it? It's a big way SFS. There's a whole bunch of them. Sure, yeah. The SFS that I have here with the logo with the chain is the self-certifying file system. And this was David Mazieres' uh, PhD thesis, I think, or maybe it was his master's thesis? Uh, one of these two. Um, it was a brilliant idea. So this came way back, uh, and basically uh, DM was, was annoyed with the CA system and how we have this model with a tree structure where any single uh, valid CA can sign for any other and he wanted to move the world to an egalitarian namespace where anybody could generate valid certificates and valid keys and then self, uh, and then certify other people. And the way that, you, there's this bootstrap problem with any kind of certification process of like how do you get people to trust uh, people in the, from the beginning? And the general idea that, that SFS came up with uh, is that you could construct links that some part of the path embeds the hash of a public key. And so if I, if I know that I'm going to be talking to the hash of this public key, and, I'm, and the data that I'm getting served from this resource that I'm accessing is signed by the private key corresponding to that uh, public key, then I know that I'm speaking to the right person. So this is self-certifying. This is like the, yeah, the idea. I'll go, I'll, I'll go into it in more detail because this is a very simple, very elegant, simple solution to a very hard problem that you kind of have to see to glean out. Um, cool. So, so the model that we're proposing is to is to divide things, or, or, or to split things into having content, which is sort of the Merkle DAG and how we, we're going to structure things and describe why it's called that. Uh, and we have IPFS nodes, and these are programs, any kind of program uh, that's distributing this Merkle DAG data. And these programs can be running on your computer. These programs can be running on a server out there. These programs can be running in your browser. You could, we're designing IPFS with, with the hard constraint that an IPFS node could be embedded into other running processes. So you could use it like an embedded database uh, instead of like SQLite or instead of LevelDB or something. Uh, or you could run a really large node with a lot of resources as this, its own entity on the web um, that you request files from, like the more traditional HTTP server model. Mm -hmm. um, and we are making it so that the protocols are lightweight enough that Internet of Things type devices can run them. Uh, where like, you know, devices that you have everywhere can be part of these of this network and speak the same protocol to each other. So, so we're going for the ubiquity of, of HTTP. Uh, because if we don't do that, then we're gonna fall short. There's a lot of solutions, but part of the way a lot of the solutions in the past have failed is because they said, well, our general use case is this, so we don't care about all these other use cases, doesn't matter, that's it. Um, and so they didn't get to advance, uh, advance the, the, the world in a big way because you really have to go for ubiquity. You have to go for any program given a duplex byte. doesn't matter if they can't open ports, if they can't open, um, if they can't connect to specific other locations. Given a duplex byte to another IPFS node, they should be able to speak this. Uh, all right, an IPFS data forms a DAG, uh, and so that means that, uh, you know, th think of, the web is a web of documents where you have documents linking between things, right? In a DAG, um, it, DAG means directly asynchronous, but graph means that nodes only point, uh, the nodes, the edges have a, have a direction, uh, but not only do they have a direction, it's acyclic, meaning that uh, 
once you go down, you can't find a cycle all the way back out. So the web today doesn't work that way because you can navigate to a web page and then go back to other web pages, and it's it's really like a like a very mutable medium. And turning it into a DAG makes it uh, easier to reason about moving around. And specifically, not only is it a DAG, but it happens to be a Merkle DAG, meaning that the links are hashes of the other nodes, so that in this edge, so here one is pointing to two, three and four, two is pointing to three, four is pointing to five, and so when you look at one inside of it, that means that in the data that represents one, it has a link table, and this link table has the hash of, the specific hash of these other objects. In this case, it would have a hash of two, and it would have like a, that number in the middle is the size, the size of the data. Uh, it becomes relevant for replication purposes, but not really important right now. And the, the third thing is the name. So one knows two uh, by the name of foo, for example. Or one knows three by the name of bar. And one knows four by the name of bass. Uh, and the actual link is not a, an HTTP location, but it's actually the hash of the other node. Right? So if we try to resolve, so, so what this, this allows you to do, by the way, the fact that we have names here um, allows us to resolve links to this, this DAG. So if we wanted to resolve, uh, so, so suppose the hash of one is this QMW98 thing, uh, and so if we wanted to resolve slash IPFS slash QMW98 as one, like that's what we would got, get, right? So slash IPFS slash that hash would give us object one. If we wanted to get the same path slash foo, we would be resolving for two. Is that, does that kind of make sense there? That jump? So we're, we're traversing paths through the graph, uh, you know, starting at the very root, uh, we specify the protocol that we're going to use, slash IPFS. Then we say, take one hash as the very base, like, start starting node, and from there, crawl into foo. So we fetch one, we access the link table, we look at foo, we find another hash, and then we pull out that node, which is, in this case, two. Uh, bar is three, and foo slash bith is also three. And so what does that mean? It means that we looked, so we started with object one. Inside of it, we went, so we went to foo, so we looked up the name foo, we found a, a hash there, we pulled out that node, which happens to be two. We looked at its link table, found bith, uh, found another hash, and then we pulled that one out. And that's object three, right? So object three here has two names. Uh, you might notice that all these objects also have another name, which is just slash IPFS slash their hash. So you can access, you can treat any object here as the root as well, uh, but you can traverse into it down any path. This is getting pretty uh, down into the gory details of how this works, uh, but it's pretty critical that, that this comes across because what this means is that we can do paths like the web today. We can do the whole notion of URLs and URL schemes and crawling and traversing through a graph, uh, but we can do it with, with these Merkle tags. And this is not a new idea. This, we didn't come up with this. This has been around for a long time. Um, from my perception, this came from Git. Uh, that Git has this idea of trees and blobs, and you can access things the same way. They represent the unit classes in this way. But it's even, it, you know, I, I didn't know enough. Uh, it, you, it actually goes way back. Um, it goes that be behind things like Monotone. I believe Monotone did this. Uh, it goes back to other content addressing systems. It goes back to even SSH R, SFS RO. Uh, which is a read-only file system built on SFS, did this already. There's been, this idea is old. Uh, how, do you, yeah. how do you prevent hash from hash versions? So if you notice, our hashes, so here's, here's where, where um, first of all, the hashes are cryptographic, right? So we hope that the cryptographic func function that we're using uh, will last us long, for a long period of time. But you're right, none of the cryptographic hashes that we have can, can assure us that we won't find a way to break them and find collisions. It's generally an extremely rare event, right? Like we don't have hash collisions. We haven't found hash collisions um, for <coughs> the hash functions that we, uh, we use today. But this can happen. So if you notice that all of the hashes start with QM, this is a format that we use called multi-hash. And the beginning of the format specifies the hash function. So we know which hash function was used to generate this, this hash. So that if you, if you can use a new hash function to upgrade the whole thing, 
uh, this is this is like a like a weak point of of of, uh, of how this is structured because it means that the links would have to change in that event. But this is like a decade long process. Like two hashes. That makes why SSLS has two hashes. Um, yeah. So, so you could actually start hashing objects with two multiple hashes and be able to start addressing them through through the different paths. You, you would basically have different paths to access the same thing. Uh, and as a, as a hash function becomes basically stale. Uh, the system can start upgrading. It, it's, it, we want to find better ways to do this, by the way. So if, if, you, if there's like a good way to solve, to put into the, how we are structuring things now, that can get rid of this painful upgrading where we would break some links, like that would be awesome. Uh, the, the way that we're going about it and we're thinking about it is that we can solve this in the writing system. When you, I'll get to it in a bit, but when the way you actually pull objects out is that you ask people who has these objects. And so you can store some records in the writing system to describe this, this object is also hashed at these other locations, but you have to do that very early on, way before the hash function. That it, way before it's very trivial to break the function because by that point it would be too late, right? Um, but, but it allows it to be upgradable, right? And by anyone. Um, all right. So it turns out that any data structure can be represented as this DAG. We can take Unix files and directories and put them on the Merkle DAG. That's kind of what Git does. We can take, so yeah, so Git has this notion of blobs, trees, and commits. So we can do version control on top of this. Uh, we can do blockchains on top of this. You can imagine these objects being blocks in a blockchain and pointing to other blocks or pointing to transactions or pointing to wallets. And so identities in Bitcoin could be these objects. Uh, this also means that you could perhaps, uh, when you build a blockchain on top of IPFS or you wrap it with IPFS, you could take a, the Bitcoin blockchain as it is today and just wrap it. Um, you can start pointing to other resources in other systems. So you could have a Bitcoin transaction that knows how to reference a git commit. And so you could say like, hey, for this git commit, I am giving you money or something, right? And so you can, you can start doing these kinds of things. Uh, and, you can use, and you can represent any app arbitrary key value store as this Merkle there. So that means that you can use IPFS as a database locally. Uh, and you, you, know, you can do the whole relational um, making a relational database is really just a set of data structures on top of a key value store. So, you know, you have extensibility that way. Uh, I'll just like sort of walk through how you would turn a Unix file system into a DAG. Um, you know, you can think of files as DAG nodes themselves, so each file gets its own DAG node. Uh, big files could be split into many DAG nodes, so you could look at multiple different, uh, you could chunk a file into multiple different pieces, and each one of these would be an object. You could look at directories as their own DAG nodes that have links. Uh, and you can look at, and then you can see, uh, you know, all these links would define the relationship between the directories and files. Right. So that's pretty kind of straightforward. Does that make sense to everybody? So if, if you were to think about how you would represent, you know, your local home, home directory in IPFS, is that is that kind of like a straightforward mapping for you? Cool. So sorry for the switch on the background. I grafted some slides and didn't have time to go through and change the backgrounds. Um, I wish that was easy. I wish you could just tell Keynote, oh, adjust the style. Um, maybe you can. Anyway. Yeah. So we we saw how paths work, but to make it even more visual, like you know the hash, x, l, y, whatever, means a specific object. Inside of it has this link table. It points to another object. We pull it out. It has a link name. We pull that object, and we get the data. So if we request it from IPFS, give me the path slash IPFS slash x, l, y, whatever, slash foo slash bar dot text, we would get the portion of text, or the portion of binary data called data3 here. Uh, that means, so here's the, the blockchain explanation. So imagine. This is the head of a blockchain, and it has some data inside of it, and it has like a parent link, and the parent link points to another object, and the that object has maybe a TX link, which happens to <coughs> link to a directory of transactions, and maybe you can look at transaction 15, and that's a specific transaction, and you pull it out, and maybe it has some inputs and outputs, and and so on, right? So that this is how you would structure a blockchain on IPFS, and it makes it immediately searchable and indexable by anything. So you don't need to run like a large service that looks at the blockchain and transforms it into an HTTP RESTful interface 
like some of them, because so I think companies that do this uh, and make it easy for you, which is very much agreed, like a, a valuable service. But we should be able to do this just in the network. Like we should just have a protocol, an open protocol that does it, and a few tools, and just replace it, right? Um, anyway. Uh, yeah, and so the reason it's called Merkle DAG is because the links are hashes. Yeah? Uh, is there a reason why the path has to start with the IPMS? Uh, is Ladder. there a reason why uh, the path started with the IPMS? Yeah, so we could have this, the path starting with just a hash, right? Yeah. Um, why does a why does a URL start with HTTP? Because it's a protocol. So IPFS is a protocol. So so this, this is related to a different rant, but um, <laughs> which I think somebody get recorded for me. Uh, yeah, there we go. Um, we prefix with the protocol because we want to make the web and Unix. <laughs> come back together. Right, so Unix had this file system idea that it was really beautiful and really abstract and you could mount any other file system within the path structure and access any resource through it and you know, Plan 9 really took it very far. Right? It represented everything as a resource on this beautiful file system uh, idea. Uh, and then the web, uh, in creating a new world, like it went and invent, reinvented the wheel in many locations, in many places, and one of them was that it created the idea of a protocol identifier. And like if you look at a URL and how it's structured, it has a protocol identifier, and then a host, and then a path. Um, that's, on, in my view, on very unnecessary complexity, because you could do the same thing in a Unix file system and make it composable. So you could have slash HTTP, slash domain, slash path, and so on, and that would mean something to the local machine because it's mounted, it mounts the web at slash HTTP. Right? And I think there are a couple of clever hacks that do this. But the problem, though, is that you now have to map things from the HTTP colon slash slash whatever format to the slash HTTP slash whatever format. What if we created a web that went back to Unix and said, let's structure oral, oral our identifiers using the very nice mountable general um, path structure so that you can mount the entire thing, the entire system into the OS. And so you can access this web both through a browser and through the OS. So you can have binaries that compute uh, on objects by just reading them from, from the file system. And you can have web applications that compute on these objects by requesting them through the browser. Right. What happens if Windows? Letter. For Windows. Uh, Say that. Things louder. On Windows. Yeah. yeah so, <laughs> right. Uh, funnily, uh, yeah. So, Windows has like the backslash. Uh, yeah, it's a backslash. Uh, <laughs> There are straight up mappings for that. So, in fact, if you look at most people's machines um, today, whenever they install, <coughs> they reach a certain amount of complexity after installing a certain amount of, <laughs> of applications that install mappings of the paths, as far as I understand it, um, where uh, their systems are able to now resolve paths with like a forward slash. That's just a straight up substitution, though, <laughs> that you can do at the OS level and have a simple library that just wraps the paths. So the IPFS implementation in Windows would just map those paths for you. So an application would be able to access it with backslashes. Maybe the same thing. But it's it's like a, it's, it's a bit different. Or, or It's an important point, um, and it's annoying that this exists, but you know, we have, it, it's, a solve, it's a much more solvable problem than mapping from the protocol identifier to this, because people in the web and designing the web aren't really thinking about mounting these things in the OS, or mounting these things into, into VMs or whatever. Uh, cool, any other questions on this? Yeah. Have you looked at the Gopher protocol? Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Like 25 years old protocol. Yep. Yeah. Look, uh, these ideas aren't <laughs> new, right? Like, these ideas are like, old. Yeah. It's just kind of like even, saying, hey, everyone. Even pre-internet, there was FinoNet that Yes. So, yeah. why did the web break the wheel? <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> anyway, um, yes. Like, like I agree. This is this is this specific point is not new. It just kind of like we have to deal with it and do the legwork involved in putting us back into the right track. So, which is why if you name IPFS resource like a request, please 
don't do IPFS colon slash slash, please do slash IPFS slash whatever. Because if we, if we start that way and we build all these resolvers that can work in the web, and we have this working in the web, um, then uh, it will all work seamlessly so we can bring back the web on Unix. Cool. Uh, Rogue Lang gets links of hashes. You know, think about it like it. Uh, cool. Any other? So, by the way, Merkle. Why is it called the Merkle DAG? Right. So, people might be familiar with Merkle tree, and for a long time, these systems have been called Merkle tree-based systems. Uh, so, many people prefer to Git as a Merkle tree. Uh, but I claim that it's not. Uh, I claim that, that Git is a distinct data structure from a Merkle tree, and there's an important distinction to be made because when cryptographers talk about Merkle trees, they think this, for the most part, um, and not always, but for the most part. And so a Merkle tree is a, is a data structure where it's purely a hash tree where the nodes, the internal nodes, are only hashes and they're, they're bunched together and the data exists only at the leaves. Uh, a, the Git objects don't look like that, right? So they have data in these blobs, but the trees are also data. They have important data and the commits also have important data. Uh, a blockchain is also not a Merkle tree, but it is a Merkle bag. Right? A blockchain has this structure with hashes and links and so on. Uh, so the Merkle trees, Git, and the blockchain are all Merkle DAGs, but the blockchain and Git are not Merkle trees. Is that good? Cool. This is why it's called that. Uh, sometimes I have to like describe it, but uh, we decided to name it this because in calling things Merkle trees, it became a very difficult uh, communication process when people start making assumptions about how the thing behaves that are based on the different interpretation of the data structure. So I'm calling for people to please name git a Merkle DAG, not a Merkle tree. Um, all right. Uh, we, we already saw how like this structure works, uh, but very roughly, the, the idea here is that every node in IPFS could have links or data, and making it that allows you to build anything on top of it. An IPFS node, uh, by contrast, so not the actual data nodes, but the programs that are going to be running this protocol, uh, all of them have a cryptographic identity, so they have a, a public and private key pair. Uh, you can sign the, the key pair so that you know uh, where, uh, you, you can sign the key pair so that you can create this, this hierarchy of control or ownership about which node means what. Um, these nodes connect to each other, uh, they store parts of the DAG. Uh, they can get more pieces of the DAG from each other, so they exchange the objects, the data objects, and they can be run as a server, or they can be run embedded in applications, which means that uh, you can think of them as HTTP servers today uh, and run them sort of on their own, or you can think of them as a, as a network service on your, on your computer and have like an IPFS service running on your OS that other applications talk to, or you can actually just embed it directly to your application, right? If you don't if you're going to write a simple application that you want deployed in a whole bunch of use cases, you can embed the actual thing into your application, much like an HTTP server, right? So when we think about HTTP servers today, it's trivial to embed an HTTP server into your application. There's a whole bunch of libraries for it. Ten years ago, that wasn't the case. People thought about HTTP servers as, a, as you know, Apache and Nginx and a few others, but you know, they were their own separate thing. But now it's you know trivial to just be like, oh great, like I'll write an API. I'll just put in an HTTP server into my application. And so we want, we're designing IPFS for that type of ease of use as well. A any questions on this? This is kind of like just describing <coughs> our model. And these IPFS nodes form peer-to-peer -peer networks. They're all transport agnostic, so we can't even, we can't even uh, have the constraint that we are able to open a port, because in some cases we can't. Uh, the OS doesn't let us, or we're in a browser, so we can't open a UDP or TCP port. All we get is WebRTC or WebSockets, um, or HTTP. So we should be able to work across any single transport. And, and so we take the internet layering very seriously here. We're not making assumptions. Uh, and we have to perform that traversal. So this is one of the things where, because of the state of the network today, we have to go through the process of being able to cluster NATs and open ports wherever possible and in the worst case, be able to relay. Uh, so for any node to find each other, we have to be able to relay. And that net traversal part is dependent on the routing system. So a lot of, a lot of, our, our, of our design actually points out that many of the problems that people try to solve 
really depend on how you want to do routing, how you want to nodes to find each other and find content. And that is a, a thing that you can sort of modularize as a thing and then replace others, but don't make assumptions above that layer. Um, and so routing systems are things like PHTs and so on. Um, you know, this is like a standard Ford model. Uh, or can, uh, I think Ken Emily's on the right. Uh, and you can think of like IPFS nodes somewhere in a ring and you know, nodes pointing to other nodes and nodes being responsible for portions of it. Uh, but this is one implementation of a writing system. It happens to be the trivial implementation we have today because it's DHC and Trident and true and they scale pretty nicely. But other writing systems can come in and be replaced depending on your application use case. For example, if you're inside a data center and you need to write uh, route to find some other node and find a specific piece of content, you don't want to go and ask another node in the DHT, in the global DHT, somewhere else where the thing is. You might want to have like your own specific thing. <coughs> uh, the exchange I described works a little bit like BitTorrent. You can like you know get the pieces, and that's it. All right. <sighs> Thanks for bearing with me. That was a lot. It, it's important to install those pieces of information into your brain because if I don't then it'll be very confusing when you're like manipulating the thing. You're like, what? Why does this even work this way? Uh, we did not go over a whole bunch of things, including how we do mutability, which is our, our IP NS, not NS, but IP NS, uh, and a few other things that we might get to explaining, but like, I also don't want to go too far. Um, so in this demo, what we're going to go, so I'm going to give you a quick demo, and I'm going to make it interactive. So uh, we're all going to go and do things together. I'm going to play with it, and we're, you're going to ask me questions, and so on. And so for this, uh, the first, we're going to do two things. We're going to install IPFS. Uh, if you haven't installed it, it's pretty quick. Um, and we're going to uh, get on a Gitter channel so that we can write messages to each other. So we can exchange hashes. Uh, yeah? I'm going to have to find the Skew chain? All right, let me see where. 